The Premier League was the highest spending league in world football in the 2023 summer transfer window, just as it has been every season now, for the last 20 years. You have to go all the way back to the 2001-02 season, three years before Evan Ferguson was born, for the last time that the Premier League wasn't the world's highest spending division, in which it was second to Serie A. That season, Juventus sold Zinedine Zidane and signed Lilian Toram, Pavel Nedved and Gianluigi Buffon. Serie A had a total spend of 816 million euros that season and a net spend of 54 million. The Premier League, by comparison, had a total spend of 2.8 billion euros this season and a net spend of 1.3 billion. No other league had expenditure in excess of 1 billion euros, let alone net spend. Next up was actually France's league on, followed by the Saudi Pro League, Serie A, the Bundesliga, and then La Liga. The combined net spend of all five doesn't even come to a quarter of the Premier League's net spend. So where is all of that money going? Well, over £200 million of it went on Declan Rice and Moises Caicedo alone, meanwhile Josko Gvardial, Kai Havertz, and Rasmus Hoyland cost about the same again. But, much more importantly, which teams had the best and worst transfer windows? Well, it's funny that you should ask actually, because that's exactly what this video is all about. Here is how I would rank, and yes, you will disagree with me, and that's all part of the fun of it, all 20 Premier League teams transfer business in the 2023 summer transfer window from worst to best. 20th, Everton. I take absolutely no joy in piling yet more misery on Everton, but I'm afraid that I have to rank them in dead last. The Toffees had the third lowest spend and the third lowest net spend in the transfer window, as one of only four Premier League teams to turn a profit. That probably isn't great news from an Everton fan's perspective though, off the back of successive seasons in which they only narrowly avoided the drop, and with a general consensus that significant surgery was required this summer to prevent a similar fate from befalling them this season. It's not all bad for Everton. Portuguese centre-forward Berto, signed for €30 million Euros from Udinese, looks to be a real handful, and attacking reinforcements were desperately needed, given Dominic Calvert-Lewin's persistent injury problems. If nothing else, he surely can't be any less effective than Neil Mope, who left Everton on transfer deadline day to rejoin his former club Brentford on loan. Moyes Ken, Thomas Cannon, and Ellis Sims also departed, but losing Alex Awobi is the biggest blow, who was not only a key man at Goodison Park, but has joined a direct relegation rival in Fulham. Ultimately, a 19-year-old Yusuf Chimiti, 38-year-old Ashley Young, and the lone arrivals of Arnaud Danjuma and Jack Harrison, twinned with Awobi's departure, doesn't inspire enormous confidence about the campaign ahead. Profit and sustainability regulations have weighed heavy on Everton in recent years, following reckless and at times brainless spending when Farhad Mashiri first bought the club. There were unlikely to be any blockbuster arrivals at Goodison this summer for that reason, and indeed there weren't. I think every one of Everton's relegation rivals has recruited better than them, albeit only very narrowly in the case of the club up next, and for that reason I fear for them, and they have to get us started. 19th, Fulham. If Fulham hadn't signed Alex Awobi on transfer deadline day, making him their marquee summer arrival and depriving Everton of one of their better players, then the positioning of the two teams would have been reversed in this list. It would be fair to say that it has been a tumultuous summer at Craven Cottage, and I don't just mean because of the announcement of their new £3,000 season tickets. It started with talk of Marco Silva and Alexander Mitrovic heading to Saudi Arabia, and while Silva turned an offer down, which was probably the biggest positive of Fulham's off-season, along with keeping hold of Joao Polina, Mitrovic's head was turned. Last season, Mitrovic's 14 goals fired Fulham to a 10th place finish in their first season back in the top flight. Their next highest scorer scored just five goals. Raul Jimenez is the man tasked with replacing Mitrovic, a job that he might well have been up to a few years ago before suffering a devastating skull fracture, but one which will present an almighty task for the Mexican now. 
Calvin Bassi and Timothy Castagna are both good signings. Meanwhile, Fode Balotore brings a lot of experience and pedigree on loan from AC Milan. Overall, though, it has been a difficult summer for Fulham, who have lost their star man and top goal scorer and failed to replace him with anyone of a similar calibre. Despite finishing 10th last season then, you feel as though survival by any margin this season would represent a successful campaign this time around. 18th, Burnley. This seems very harsh, since I think Burnley have made some good signings, so I ought to stress that whilst Everton and Fulham were safely in 19th and 20th, there was very little to split about five teams between 18th and 14th. I took a little bit of heat before this season began for saying that Burnley, whilst the best equipped out of the newly promoted teams, weren't guaranteed anything this season and would most likely be in a relegation scrap. Three games and three defeats into the season, now it feels as though everyone has U-turned and has suddenly written them off. I don't think that that is right, Burnley's first three opponents, Man City, Aston Villa and Spurs, were always likely to be tough to get anything from, but it does feel as though Burnley have been a little bit scattergun in the transfer market. Despite winning over 100 points in the championship last season, Burnley have signed an incredible 15 players this summer, 13 on a permanent basis, and two on loan. Some of them, like Sanderberg and particularly Hando Masengo on a free transfer from Bristol City, look like really shrewd additions. Others, like James Trafford and Aaron Ramsey, may well be great players in the future, in fact, I suspect that they will, and the same is actually true of Masengo, but I'm not sure how much they've improved Burnley right now. If Burnley can stay up this season, they have signed some very young and promising players who should only improve. I just fear that maybe they looked a little too far ahead and didn't target signings who, with a more than 100 million euro net spend, could have all but guaranteed them survival. 17th, Wolves. I made a whole video about Wolves' chaotic pre-season preparations, issues relating to spending regulations, and my suspicion that Julian Lopetegui might walk. 14 hours later, he did just that. Since then, however, Wolves have signed four new players, one of them on loan, in addition to losing Mateus Nunes to Manchester City for £53 million. Nunes joined Ruben Neves, Nathan Collins, Connor Cody, Raul Jimenez, João Moutinho, and Adama Traore in leaving Molyneux during the summer window, which is an enormous exodus and sense of churn for a club that only finished seven points above the drop last season. Aside from the formality of Mateus Cunha and Bubakar Traore's low moves becoming permanent, Wolves have signed exciting Strasbourg midfielder Jean Rickner Belagar, Uruguayan centre back Santiago Bueno, Paraguayan teenager Enzo Gonzalez, Tom King and Matt Doherty on free transfers, and Tommy Doyle on loan from Manchester City. Wolves feature so low down because they lost a key man in Nunes, and I still don't think that they've addressed their most glaring weakness, which is at centre forward and a lack of goals. 16th, Crystal Palace. I like the look of the current Crystal Palace team, and unlike some people, I don't think that they should have too many relegation concerns this season. But I don't think that that is the result of outstanding summer recruitment. Aside from anything else, Palace barely signed anyone. Marquis signing Matthias France is an exciting addition to the Premier League from Flamengo, though he is still only 19 years old. Dean Henderson will rival Sam Johnston 4 and, I suspect, eventually take his number one shirt. Rob Holding is a solid utility player, at a good age and with good pedigree who arrived for a very modest fee. And Jefferson Lerma is a fantastic addition on a free transfer from Bournemouth. More important than any of Palace's arrivals, however, are the players that they were able to keep hold of. Wilfred Zaha finally left the club in a move to Galatasaray, but Mark Gay, Cech Decore, Michael Alise, and Eberet Chiesa were all held on to, despite significant interest in them. Had Palace added a centre-forward, and they reportedly came close with Kelechi and Acho, I'd probably have bumped them up another few places. But as it is, despite vital player attention, their minimal additions probably only merit a spot in 16th. 15th, Manchester United. Will this be controversial? Probably, it is Manchester United. But I think it's reasonable. 
Manchester United spent over 200 million euros in the summer transfer window, but the key question to ask, as with every team, is how much have they actually improved? Johnny Evans has rejoined the club on a free transfer. Sofyan Amrabat has finally been signed on a 10 million euro season long loan deal. Mason Mount has been prized away from his boyhood club Chelsea. Rasmus Hoyland was the Red Devils' most expensive addition. And Champions League finalist Andre Anana has been brought in from Inter Milan, along with Olte Bindor from Fenerbahce, as his number two. At the opposite end, Anthony Alanga, Dean Henderson and Fred have all departed. The first two for not exactly enormous fees given their potential, and I really thought that off the back of his outstanding loan last season, goalkeeper Mate Kovar would command a fee of more than 5 million euros. Ultimately, the success, or lack thereof, of Manchester United's summer window rests primarily on the shoulders of a 20-year-old Rasmus Hoyland, who scored 9 goals in 32 games for Atalanta in Serie A last season. I still think that centre-forward is a problem position for Eric Ten Hag, and in an ideal world, Hoyland would be brought in as an understudy or at least an alternate, a bit like Julian Alvarez at Manchester City, rather than as the main man with immediate enormous expectations. I'm not entirely convinced that Manchester United have done enough to improve upon a third-place finish last season, Hence 15th. 14th. Chelsea. By far the hardest team to judge in this list, Chelsea have once again spent the earth in the summer transfer window and signed enough players to name a brand new starting 11. So I'll just try to lay out the pros and cons which resulted in me putting them 14th. In terms of the positives, I think that Moises Caicedo is capable of becoming one of the best midfielders in the world. I think that Romeo Lavia is fantastic, and adding the two of them to Enzo Fernandez ought to give Chelsea, emphasis on ought to there, one of the best midfields in world football. The likes of Christopher Nkuku and Nicholas Jackson are also both, in isolation I think, very good signings. The problem, of course, is Chelsea's enormous squad, scattergun recruitment, and absolutely wild spending. Nearly half a billion euros was spent this summer, on top of the billion that went on new arrivals last season, and Chelsea's squad doesn't reflect either their extraordinary spend or net spend during that time. They've also lost Lewis Hall for about half what they paid for Mark Kukurea, a set of deals which I suspect history won't be kind to, and they've ended up after spending over one and a half billion euros with Brighton's number two last season as their new number one. All in all, as much as I like Caicedo and Lavia, Chelsea paid fair value for them and then some, and the weaknesses that still exist within their squad means 14th is about as generous as I can stretch to. 13th, Sheffield United. We have to be honest about Sheffield United, because a few weeks ago, you'd have had them dead last in this list. In Illaman and Die and Sanderberg, the Blades sold arguably their two most talented players following promotion, certainly in the case of Undai, as well as losing their two outstanding Manchester City loanees from last season, whilst only having signed totally unproven Premier League players. What a difference a week can make, though. The signing of Cameron Archer I think is a masterstroke, and I wouldn't even be surprised if he hit double figures this season, which would be a monumental achievement in this team. Gustavo Hamer, likewise, is a fantastic addition, not just in terms of preparing for the worst case scenario of relegation, but actually I think he is more than ready for the step up. Throw in Tom Davies on a free transfer, Luke Thomas, and crucially, one of those two loanees from Manchester City last season, James McAtee returning, and Sheffield United have given themselves a fighting chance. I still think that it'll probably be beyond them, but their window has been nowhere near as disastrous as it looked like it might be at one stage. 12th, Nottingham Forest. I can't go through all of Nottingham Forest signings, obviously, a bit like with Chelsea, because we would be here for hours. Inevitably, when a team is so active, as Forest were last season as well, there will be hits and misses. My prediction is that Anthony Alanga, Gonzalo Montiel, and Andre Santos ought to be successes, the latter two haven't been signed on loan, and if Forrest can get anything like the best out of Callum hudson Adoy, he will be one of the bargains of the season at just £3 to £5 million subject to add-ons from Chelsea. 
This is a man, after all, who Chelsea once rejected a £70 million bid for from Bayern Munich. On the flip side, Forrest lost Brennan Johnson very late in the day to Tottenham, albeit for a healthy fee. I still think their squad is far too bloated for a team that isn't in Europe, and it may prove difficult for Steve Cooper to keep everyone content. And is a 31-year-old Chris Wood still worth £15 million off the back of just four goals in 35 games over the last 18 months at Newcastle United? I suppose he is a proven and capable deputy for the outstanding Taiwo Wanyi, but all in all, Forest featuring mid-table. 11th, Liverpool. As with 18th to 14th, there isn't a great deal to split 13th all the way through to 7th, and obviously hindsight will paint a very different story about the winners and losers of this summer window. Liverpool featuring mid-table because I think that it has been a bit of a mixed bag. Obviously. I don't think Fabinho or Henderson are massive losses at this stage in their careers, nor Cater, Milner or Oxlade-Chamberlain. And £40 million for Fabinho at 29 years old is sensational business. In Dominic Soberslai, Alexis McAllister and Ryan Hraffenberg, I think Liverpool have upgraded their midfield, particularly in a creative sense. The question mark surrounds their defensive capabilities, and I don't think it's any great secret that Wataru Endo wasn't Liverpool's first choice as a midfield sitter. Make no mistake, Endo is a temporary stopgap after they missed out on Caicedo and Lavia, and had Liverpool signed either of those two, that'd probably propel them all the way up to 7th. If they lose Salah over the next couple of days, I'd probably put them in 18th. It is fine margins. 10th. Bournemouth. It seems like no one is quite sure what to expect of Bournemouth this season. Gary O'Neill's sacking was deemed harsh, despite the supposed melon scandal, but Andoni Arola arrives with a fantastic reputation, and it feels like the same is true of Bournemouth's summer recruitment. Tyler Adams and Lewis Sinistera both play Premier League football with Leeds United last season, as has Max Ahrens in the past with Norwich, and Hammer Junior Traore on loan at Bournemouth briefly last season, but the rest are predominantly very young and new to the league. Alex Scott was outstanding in the championship with Bristol City, meanwhile Milos Kerkes was excellent at AZ last season, but they are just 19 and 20 years old. Roman Fav, signed for £15 million from Lyon, is someone who I like a lot, but he has been allowed to join Laurent on loan this season. All in all, Bournemouth have made some exciting additions to a young and enthusiastic squad with a young and inventive head coach. Survive this season and they should be well placed for the next few years to come. It's only one or two short-term concerns that prevent me from putting them in my top five or six. Ninth, Brentford. Brentford's recruitment has been among the best in world football over the last five to ten years, but they went in a slightly different direction this summer. Renowned for looking overseas for bargains and rarely breaking the bank, Brentford's biggest summer signing was Nathan Collins, brought in from Premier League rivals Wolves for £23 million. That makes Collins Brentford's club record signing, which was previously set by Kevin Sharder just a few weeks earlier, in the same window. Sharder, who spent the second half of last season on loan at Brentford, was part of a double signing from Freiburg, along with goalkeeper Mark Flecken, who replaced the departed David Raya. Departed in the sense that he joined Arsenal, he hasn't died. Brentford's most surprising summer business, perhaps, was the deadline day decision to take Neil Mope on a season-long loan deal from Everton. Mopé has been dreadful at Everton, where he has scored just one goal in 30 games, but he struck 25 times in his last season at Brentford in the Championship. If he can rediscover some of that confidence back in West London, who knows, he could prove to be a shrewd stopgap while Ivan Tony is suspended. It wasn't major surgery at Brentford then, but a few strategic additions without losing any of their best players, other than Raya, is enough to earn them a top-half finish. 8th, Arsenal. Having faded during the run in last season, Arsenal were determined to send out a signal of intent this summer, and that signal came in the form of Declan Rice. At £105 million, Rice didn't come cheap, to put it mildly, but he could well be Arsenal's main man in midfield for the next decade, and a future club captain. 
Kai Havertz, Jurian Timber and David Raya were Arsenal's other summer signings, though Timber has unfortunately already suffered an ACL injury, which is likely to rule him out for most of this season. Arsenal didn't lose anyone that they didn't want to this summer, though the upfront fee of just over £25 million for Flar and Balogun seems low for a striker who scored 21 goals in France's top flight as a 21-year-old last season. Arsenal have improved during the summer window. Not enough to win the league, I don't think, but enough to keep progressing with the young squad and to take a spot in eighth. Seventh, Newcastle United. We tend to have quite knee-jerk reactions in football, I don't know if you've noticed, so it would be easy for me to say that West Ham have done the best transfer business and Newcastle the worst, because they have lost three of their opening four games, but I don't think that is the case. Newcastle got good fees for Chris Wood and Alan St. Maximin, while signing clear upgrades in midfield and out wide with Sandro Tonali and Harvey Barnes. Very long-term subscribers may recall that I was a big fan of Tonali at Brescia, but I don't think that he ever really kicked on as expected at AC Milan, and £55 million is a chunky fee. Nonetheless, the talent is there, and if Eddie Howe and his team can get the best out of him, they have a serious player on their hands. The same is true for both Tino Libramento and Lewis Hall, both of whom are future England internationals, if they can fulfil their potential. And Libramento may even already have won a cap if it wasn't for missing last season with an ACL injury. Basically, Newcastle have signed some good players, but no real blockbuster arrivals, and they haven't exactly got any of them on the cheap. So 7th feels about right. 6th, Manchester City. Pep Guardiola likes to refresh his squad and keep his players on their toes, and I think that it is perhaps underestimated just how much churn there has been at the Etihad this summer. The likes of Riyad Mahrez, Ilkay Gundogan and Amerik Laporte have been key parts of Man City's success in recent years, meanwhile Joao Cancelo was still considered arguably the league's best fullback only 12 months ago, and Cole Palmer looks set for a big season after his well-taken goal in the Community Shield at Wembley against Arsenal. Now they're all gone, with 115 million euros having been generated, but a further 241 million euros spent on just four players. They are Josko Gvardial, who is now the most expensive defender of all time at the current Euro exchange rate, midfield reinforcements Mateo Kovacic and Mateus Nunes, and exciting wide man Jeremy Doku. Have Manchester City improved? Well, I think that it's hard to say given Ilkay Gundogan's departure and prior importance, but there is a freshness to the squad now, which probably needed reinvigorating, strange as it may sound, mentally if nothing else, after winning the treble. Overall, I think that they have done good business with an almost identical net spend to Bournemouth. Fifth, West Ham United. Losing Declan Rice was always going to be a hammer blow for West Ham this summer, but the key thing was to prepare for it and be ready to replace him. I think that they have done a fairly decent job of that, with Edson Alvarez and James Ward-Prowse, who are archetypal David Moyes signings. Alvarez because of his work rate, particularly off the ball, and ability to disrupt games in the opposition, and Ward-Prowse because he is the best set-piece specialist in the Premier League, an area where West Ham were already strong, but now appear to be devastating. Throw in Marquis signing Mohamed Kudos, who is a real coup for West Ham and had plenty of other interest in him, and Konstantinos Mavropanos, who loves to defend in a low block, and I think West Ham are a better team now, despite losing Rice, than they were when they won the Europa Conference League last season. Combine that with the fact that they are one of only four Premier League teams to have turned a profit this summer, and I don't think that fifth is too generous. Fourth, Luton Town. With three defeats from three, there will be those who question Luton Town's spot in fourth. The reality, however, is that they could finish bottom of the Premier League this season, and in reality, they should given their budget, and I would still be impressed by their summer transfer business. Luton aren't deluded as to the fact that they defied the odds to win promotion and are quite likely to go down this season, and they have recruited accordingly. Nine out of their 11 summer arrivals, including loan signings, are players who have already proven themselves in the championship. 
If Luton do go down then, the likes of Ryan Giles, Tahit Chong and Marvellous Nakamba are exactly the types of players and characters that they will want around to try and take them straight back up. What's more though, they've also targeted players with a point to prove, on modest wages, for modest fees, with huge upside and very little downside. I think they've done a very shrewd job with a long-term outlook, which should serve them well, whatever happens this season. Third, Tottenham. Not entirely unlike West Ham, Tottenham lost their best player this summer, which they always knew was a possibility, if not a practical certainty, as in the case of the Hammers, but have still, even more impressively in my eyes, somehow managed to improve. It's flown under the radar a little bit, but Spurs actually spent the second most out of any Premier League team over the summer at almost a quarter of a billion euros, trailing only Chelsea, though their net spend was about 100 million euros less than that, following the Kane sale. In James Madison, Spurs have signed someone who won't score as many goals as Kane, but looks capable of replacing him as the club's talisman. Madison has been at the heart of everything that has been good about Ange Postacoglu's side at the beginning of this season. The low moves of Dejan Kulusevski and Pedro Porro became permanent this summer. Manor Solomon is a fantastic addition on a free transfer. Guglielmo Vicaria has replaced Hugo Lloris in goal. Vicky van der Ven has transformed Spurs' ability to play the ball out from the back. And Brennan Johnson adds another attacking dimension while having the potential to become a Spurs legend. I hope that I'm not being swayed by their impressive start to the campaign because, even ignoring that, I think that Spurs have just done some really smart business. Second, Aston Villa. I'll start with what I don't like about Aston Villa's summer transfer business because there is a lot less of that. I think Cameron Archer is sensational, and not only do I think that they've sold him far too cheap, I think that they should have fought tooth and nail to convince him to stick around and compete with Ollie Watkins. Jaden Philogene also looks like an outstanding prospect, or at least he did during their preseason campaign, to be sold for just £5 million, but as a Hull City fan, I'm not complaining. On the bright side, favourable buyback clauses have been written into both of those deals, and the reason that they were expendable in the first place is due to the calibre of Villa's attacking reinforcements. Moussa Diabe is a phenomenal coup, even for more than £50 million, and I suspect that the rich six or seven may live to regret not hijacking that deal. Pau Torres and Clement Lenglet are tailor-made Unai Emery-style centre-backs, Torres having played under him already before, Yuri Tierleman on a free transfer is just a no-brainer, and Nicolo Zaniolo has the potential to be a real game-changer at Villa Park. Overall, with a net spend of just 60 million euros, which puts them slap bang in 10th among Premier League clubs, I think Villa have made huge strides forward and ought to be looking to better or at least equal their 7th place finish from last season while going deep in Europe. First, Brighton and Hove Albion. I know, I know, it is very predictable, but that doesn't mean that it isn't still right. Brighton spent just over 100 million euros this summer, whilst generating almost 190 million euros in player sales, making them the most profitable team in the Premier League in terms of player trading. It's an all too familiar tale for the Seagulls, who have grown used to repeatedly selling some of their best players over the last few years, whilst replacing them with relatively obscure and affordable targets, identified by their scouting network, with the help of Tony Bloom's Star Lizard data harvesting software. It has served them very well up to this point, and there is little to suggest that that changed this summer. Alexis McAllister and particularly Moises Caicedo are big losses in midfield, and even Brighton will struggle to improve in that department, at least in the short term, despite the recruitment of Carlos Baleba, Mahmoud Dahoud, and James Milner. In goal, though, Bart Verbruggen already looks to be a major upgrade on Robert Sanchez at the age of only 21. Joao Pedro has all the ability in the world if he can just be properly nurtured. Igor Julio gives Roberto De Zerbi great options and flexibility in terms of centre-backs. And Anzu Fati is the most eye-catching name of them all. Were it not for injuries, I've long suspected that Fatty would be one of the best players in the world by now, and although his Barca career had stalled to a certain extent, few clubs maximise their players' talents and potential better than Brighton. 
The only negative with Fatty, perhaps, is that there is no option to make his low move a permanent one in his deal. Overall, though, Brighton turned a massive profit, arguably improved the balance of their squad as a whole, and signed several young players who will, inevitably, be sold for hundreds of millions, if not billions of pounds, in the not-too-distant future. Probably to Chelsea. That is it for today's video, but thank you all very much as ever for watching. Hit the like button if you enjoyed it. Let me know your thoughts down below in the comments, and of course, it goes without saying, make sure that you are subscribed and have notifications turned on for both this channel, HITC7s, and also my second channel, Alfie Potts Harmer, both of which should be on your screens now, along with a couple of videos that you might enjoy watching after this one. You can also find me on Twitter or on Instagram via the username at HITC7s on both, and all of the links to all of those things that I just mentioned and more can be found in the video description below as well.